So um, thank you and welcome to our the, far, the last of our seminars. Um, we've enjoyed uh, doing these seminars over the past few months, so I hope um, you enjoy this final one. The work that we're talking about today uh, represents a really collaborative um, programme of work with commissioners, researchers and practitioners working together to find ways to support children's language and communication skills. So we hope you enjoy the morning. Um, so uh, to start, we'll just introduce ourselves. So I'm Claudine Bowyer Crane. I am the uh, an associate research director at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and I'll be starting off the morning. Um, and then, if I introduce you to um, Rebecca. Hi, yeah, I'm Rebecca Heald. I'm the Language Development Programs Manager for BHT Early Education and Training, and we run the Talking Together program. And then Katrina. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Katrina Dafferty. I'm a research associate at the University of York and also the Best Stop Bradford Innovation Hub and we evaluate interventions in Bradford. Thanks Katrina and Dia. Um, hi everyone, my name is Dia Nielsen. I'm also a research fellow and I've also been working at the Innovation Hub and at York as part of the team evaluating these interventions. Great, thank you very much. So that's the team. We'll be talking to you at various points throughout the morning. Um, the programme will run, um, as you can see on the screen there. So we've got a first session from nine till 10 where we'll introduce the Better Start Bradford work and then talking together, which is our home-based language intervention. Then there'll be a bit of a break. Um, then um, we will have uh, session two where we talk about Better Start Imagine and our um, con continuing professional development programme. And then we'll move into our breakout brainstorming session where we'll break into smaller groups and try and talk about um, some of the issues that we might be facing in um, using evidence to support children's language and communication and how we can move that agenda forward. And then um, at the end, we'll just have a brief roundup of the programme. But the overriding purpose of the event really is to share with you the work that we've been doing that bridges research and practice, looking at ways to support children's language development and think about how we can provide good evidence for what works. We've got a mixed audience with some policymakers, some practitioners um, and some academics and I hope there'll be something for everyone. But importantly, and this is what the breakout rooms are for, we want to use this opportunity as um, uh, as a, a way of starting conversations and collaborations. We know that there's a great deal of excellent practice going on uh, across the country and we want to find ways for people to evaluate their practice and share that practice so that children have access to high quality support. And importantly, we need a collective approach so that we don't become complacent. We, we might think, think that something works in one context, but we can't assume it will work in a different context. So we need to be constantly testing and learning. And sometimes we are thrown curveballs, none bigger than the pandemic, which has massive implications for services. And we need to think about how we capture that learning and how we respond to those challenges. So please use all the opportunities to join in the conversation, share your experiences, ask questions. We'll be moving at quite a pace as we've got a lot to cover, but we do hope that we can give you a flavour of what we've been doing. So there are lots of ways to get involved in the um, session. We are going to, before we move into the um, talking together uh, part of the programme, we're going to have um, a Mentimeter poll uh, just to find out your thoughts about the use of evidence um, in practice. Um, you can join in this poll by um, going to www.menti.com and typing in um, the code, which I'll give you um, in a moment. You can do that on your phone if you want to, so that you can see the, um, the responses come up on the screen. But if you can't do that and you need to use your computer to do that, then we will be showing the responses a bit later. We would ask you to send questions via the chat function on Zoom. We are going to have um, Q&A sessions uh, at a couple of points during the morning. So do please send your questions in so we can answer them in those Q&A sessions. We are really interested in answering your questions, finding out your thoughts about the work that we're doing. Even if you've got some suggestions or you want to share some experiences, then please put that in. You can also tweet about the morning if you want to with the hashtag support for language. And across the bottom of the screen there, you can see the Twitter handles of uh, some of our key partners, stakeholders. And then please join the breakout rooms at the end of the morning. If you can hang on uh, with us for the whole morning, those breakout rooms provides a, a, an opportunity for a rich discussion. 
After the session, we will be also asking you to give us feedback um, so we can find out what you liked and what you might have wanted to change about the session. So please, please do take um, the opportunity to, to uh, take part in all of those, all of those things. So I just want to start by setting the contact, context for our work. So we now have um, a great deal of evidence that early oral language is crucial for a child's educational, social and employment outcomes. And there are a number of reports now um, that have highlighted the concern about oral language skills in young children, particularly in areas of deprivation. Um, the Burko report 10 years on highlighted some improvements in the provision for children with um, speech, language and communication needs since the first Burko report. But there's still a lot of work to be done, um, particularly with the current pandemic, which potentially exacerbate, might exacerbate the disadvantage gaps. And we're seeing emerging reports that that, that might actually be, um, be uh, the, the situation. Um, a report from the Early Intervention Foundation suggested that language should be a public health issue and the Public Health England have just released new guidance for practitioners working with babies and toddlers and young children about how to support language and communication and um, they've uh, published a new tool, uh, the ELIM, which is being used to assess language, which um, is the idea being that it would be used um, at the two year check. So there's a lot of recognition about the importance of language and the, and the, um, the role that language plays in, in the um, overall development of, of a child. And the EEF suggests that a priority for future research is to evaluate the efficacy and cost effectiveness of pathways of support, which integrate methods for targeting through estimating a child's level of risk of persisting difficulties with a profile of interventions which provide graded responses to different levels of those risks. And that's um, essentially what Better Start Bradford is trying to do. So um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to um, tell you about Better Start Bradford um, and how and where we all fit in. So Better Start Bradford is, um, is funded by the Lottery Community Fund. There are five Better Start sites across the country um, and each site has been given around 50 million pounds to um, commission a portfolio of services to support pregnant mums and naught to three year fam babies um, living in three wards in Bradford. These are the three most deprived areas in Bradford. The interventions that they are um, commissioning focus on communication and language, which is where we come in, but also social and emotional development, which is obviously um, very uh, overlaps very much with communication and language. And then there's um, the nutrition and obesity strand as well, focusing more on physical health. So why is this input needed around language and communication? Well, Recent estimates suggest that around 20% of children in Bradford as a whole do not achieve a good level of development in language and communication by the end of their first year in school. In the uh, Better Start Bradford areas uh, where this project is based, that figure is increased to 24%. And only 63% of children in that area achieve a good level of development in literacy. So there's clearly um, a significant, the children in this area are clearly at a significant disadvantage and as I said before that disadvantage may be exacerbated by the pandemic and indeed a recent survey that we carried out with early years settings um, highlighted language and communication as a particular area of concern second only to personal social and emotional development and of course as I said before those things are, are highly interlinked. So how is Better Start Bradford making a difference to children? Well, they've commissioned 22 programmes that focus on um, an extensive programme of workforce development, promoting the understanding of early childhood development and collaboration. The social and emotional development um, programmes recognising the um, social and emotional development as the essential bedrock for children's later learning, health and behaviour. There's the communication and language uh, development programmes, which um, recognises the, uh, the uh, fundamental nature of communication and language for um, relationships, for education, for later employment, etc. And then there's a healthy diet and good nutrition during pregnancy and the first four years of life um, being vitally important for a child's growth, development and long term health. So all of those things are um, uh, being commissioned by um, Better Start Bradford to um, try and tackle some of the issues um, in the area. 
Um, for the language and communication theme, we have three key programmes talking together, which we'll be talking about in a moment. The Better Start Imagine programme, which is book gifting, which uh, Katrina will tell us about a bit later, and then professional development in terms of I can early talk, um, and I'll finish off the morning by talking about that. Better Start Bradford are working in collaboration with Born in Bradford, which is a really well established both co birth cohort study, which has been following about 13 and a half thousand children and families since 2007. And the aim of the Better Start of the Born in Bradford project is to um, understand the causes of ill health and develop interventions to address those issues. Um, Better Start Bradford and Born in Bradford have formed um, an innovation hub. So the Better Start Bradford Innovation Hub together um, is made up of academics from York, from NISA, from Bradford, from Leeds. And the role of the Innovation Hub is to provide academic expertise in the specific area of interest. And that includes um, keeping uh, Better Start Bradford up to date with advantage, advances in the research literature, considering the implications of government reports, providing expertise on um, project design and evaluation, and continual monitoring for innovative approaches to evaluation. We work closely in partnership with our service providers, um, BHT, one such service provider, they are here today, Rebecca, um, to develop robust evaluation plans. And the Innovation Hub has also set up an innovative birth cohort called Born in Bradford's Better Start. What this slide shows you is the journey through the birth cohort. So mums are recruited into the birth cohort during pregnancy, usually at the glucose tolerance test clinic. Um, and dads are also invited to join the birth cohort. And at that initial recruitment um, appointment, they complete a baseline questionnaire. We then follow them up as the baby grows, and during that time, they will be able to access the different services that Better Start Bradford have to offer. They don't have to join the Bibs cohort to access these services. The services are available to anybody in the Bradford, Better Start Bradford reach area. But for those families that do join the cohort, we will be able to use that data that we collect as part of that birth cohort um, to, to evaluate the different projects. One of the key things about the Better Start Bradford project is the work that we're doing that integrates research and practice. So we work very closely with local organisations like BHT, um, building up processes with them rather than, um, rather than trying to um, change the processes from a top down perspective. We're building up processes in collaboration. We're trying to align data collection. So we're only using routine measures or we are introducing measures that are helpful for the service. Um, and we're building up the evaluability of the projects. This is a really important part of the work that we do. So what do we mean by evaluability? Well, basically, whenever we introduce a service into a setting or a community, we want to know whether it works. So we need to carry out an evaluation of that service and look at the evidence. And that can, in help, that can help inform decisions about whether to continue with the service, whether it needs tweaking, or whether it doesn't appear to be having the desired effect and should be discontinued. So the heart of our work is, is aiming to improve the uh, levels of evidence for projects and the Early Intervention Foundation have created a really useful guide to levels of evidence for interventions and we've worked with these guides since the beginning of Be the uh, Better Start Bradford Innovation Hub. At the top of that pyramid is the gold standard for establishing whether something works, which is the randomised control trial. Now in a randomised control trial, participants are randomly assigned to either an intervention or a control group, and measures are taken before and after the intervention is completed. Now, because the groups are randomly assigned, there should not be any systematic differences between the two groups that might affect outcomes. So any difference in the outcome at the end of the intervention is likely to be as a result of the intervention. So this gives us really good evidence of whether something is effective or not. But as the pyramid shows, there's a lot of work to do before you get to that point. So before you get to point 10, take to scale, we've got to go through points one to nine. And you need to understand what questions you can ask of your evaluation, depending on what level um, on the pyramid you are. 
So we always want to know, does something work? But what that means depends on what levels of evidence already exist for that intervention. So for a novel, untested intervention, does it work should refer to questions of implementation. Can we run it? Do people come? Is it acceptable to the target audience? Now, while for those projects that have already demonstrated success, as in you've already done those bits, you can see that they've been implemented and are accepted, you can then move on to questions about outcome. Does it provide the results participants that were intended? So it's right to focus on outcome because that's ultimately important, but to do that in any meaningful way, you have to first understand implementation. If you skip this step, even if you do find evidence of outcomes, you won't really understand why or how it happened. And if you don't find the evidence of the outcomes that you want, it might be as a it might be down to a very simple um, issue around implementation that would be quite simple to fix. So it's really important that you put those uh, that level of groundwork in um, before you try and, and do a, a larger scale randomized control trial. And our webinar today will show you projects at different levels of evidence and consider some of the challenges in moving up that scale. So what I'd like to do now is just carry out this Mentimeter poll just to get a feel for people's um, uh, opinions and uh, experiences of using evidence in practice. So um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share another one. But what you can do is uh, to join in with this Mentimeter poll, if you go to www.menti.com and type the code in 79396767, then you should be able to, um, to, to join in with the poll. So let me just stop sharing this screen and start sharing this screen. I'll just give people a, a minute or so to um, log on before we start moving through the questions. Okay, so we'll go through them. So, the first question is, uh, what are the most important factors for you in deciding on whether to run a programme in your area or setting? And there are a number of options there and you can choose more than one. So um, just choose as many of those as, as you think are important in choosing whether you're going to run a programme. So cost, evidence base, ease of use, time commitment, level of training required, who it's aimed at and um, other. It's great, we can see some answers coming in now. If you're having problems logging on to Mentimeter, do just pop it, pop a, a note in the chat. Okay, we'll just give a few people, we'll just give people a couple more seconds to comment. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, okay, great. Uh, the next question is, how much evidence do you think is, how much emphasis do you think is placed on evidence when making decisions about service provision? And you just use a slider here to say a great deal of emphasis or not enough emphasis. Oh, it's quite clear there, isn't it? Okay. That's great. Some uh, mixed responses there. Lovely. Okay, so I think we'll move on. So the next question. How accessible do you think evidence is made to all stakeholders? And again, just a slider, very, very accessible or not accessible.
That's lovely. Okay. And how confident are you in engaging with and using evidence to inform your decisions? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's great. And oh, how confident are you in supporting practitioners to evaluate their practice? Lovely, okay. Okay. And that's the end of the Mentimeter poll. So thank you very much for joining in with that. And we'll um, come back to that a bit later. What I'm going to do now is stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Dia and Rebecca to talk about um, talking together. All right, thanks Claudine. Can everyone see my screen now? Just give me a thumbs up. Yeah, all right, Rebecca, do you want to go? Yeah, um, so like I mentioned earlier, I'm Rebecca Heald, the Language Development Programs Manager for BHT Early Education and Training, and I manage all the uh, communication and language uh, work across BHT. So these include the Talking Together programme that we're going to talk about now, um, the Better Start Imagine programme that will come later, and the ICANN project. Um, but we also have another programme called Fundamental Foundations. We deliver lots of training as well. So within um, my team, we have 22 staff. Um, these include the language development workers, ICANN trainers and coordinators of the different programmes. So Talking Together itself, that's our early um, intervention programme um, that, we, that we target families to deliver that service to. Um, so we deliver this programme to parents of children at two years old. Once we've, uh, once we've identified whether they have or are at risk of having a language delay. So Talking Together was developed back in 2006 when BHT formed part of the Show Start Local programme. Its creation was in response to the growing need for language support in our local community. And it started as an adaptation to the Hannon Centres it takes two to talk. We used to deliver this program um, as a, um, as, uh, in the session, uh, as session, sorry, in the centres. Um, and then we adapted uh, how we delivered that and created our own program to be delivered in the homes. So Talking Together looks to promote positive parent-child interaction by providing parents with the skills and knowledge they need to stimulate good language development in their child, improving both their support skills as a parent and the communication and language skills of their child. Talking Together is delivered by our highly skilled language development workers. And this is done in the parents' home and on a one-to-one -one basis for an hour a week over a six-week period. So each of the weeks has um, a specific topic um, and we focus on the foundations of language. So in week one, we look at um, communication, what communication is, how we communicate and why we need to be able to do this. In week two, we look at play why play is important in developing children's language skills um, and the links between play and language. In week three, we look at attention and listening and the different stages a child works through. Week four focuses on turn taking and how important this is in conversation. And week five is all about praise and encouragement. And then when we get to week six, we provide an overview of the whole programme. And if the parents want to work on a specific area, 
um, for their child, then we'll go over that, uh, that again. Or if the language development worker feels that um, there's a particular area that they need to recover, they'll do that as well. At the end of the programme, if the language development worker feels that the child still requires support, they'll refer them on to our Talking Together Plus programme or any other relevant outside agencies such as um, speech and language therapy, audiology, uh, paediatricians, somewhere you can move it on, do you? Um, so, yeah, I've mentioned that already, with, um, delivered by the language development workers. Um, and how do we do this? That we do this by um, identifying children um, through carrying out a two-year language assessment. So we use data shared by health um, that allows us to contact and invite all the children turning two within our reach area. Um, and provide them with this assessment. And again, this assessment is undertaken by our language development workers um, in the parents' home as a self-reported questionnaire. Um, and we also use the Oxford CDI. So that's the, um, what you can see up on your screen. Um, so we look at the words that the children understand and the words that the children are using. Um, and saying, um, and we use that alongside uh, the questionnaire that, that we devise. So um, the assessment tool is designed to inform the language development workers of any delayed area, um, asking the questions that relate to the child's hearing, their nonverbal communication, um, and their level of understanding. Um, so Dee is going to talk in more detail about how we created the, um, the two-year asse uh, language assessment later on. So. I'll pass you over to Dia. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, as I said at the beginning, my name is Dia Nielsen. I am a research fellow and I have been working with Rebecca on uh, evaluating Talking Together for the last four years now. And um, as Claudine mentioned at the beginning, this is it's been really important that we work closely together and that it be a collaboration. Um, and we've navigated the challenging path of trying to balance the need for rigorous evaluation with the importance of supporting the therapeutic relationships that the language development workers are so excellent at developing with the families in the community. Um, we've learned lots of things about how to embed research into practice and how to balance that rigor with the, the practical needs of, of actually delivering an intervention to families. So hopefully what you'll learn a bit about today is how we've done that and we'll learn a little bit about how you've done it. Um, so I'll go a bit, I'll, I'll go through some of the work that we've done to, as Claudine mentioned, increase the levels of evidence and the evaluability of talking together over the last four years. So first I'll just talk about our how we developed our understanding of the theory of change and the logic model. You may already know what those are, but if not, I'm going to tell you a bit about them. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'll talk about how we changed the screening tool to make it more quantifiable and useful for our evaluation purposes. And finally, I'll talk a bit about how we added additional outcome measures um, and why this was important. So um, this is our theory of change. So our theory of change is um, a way of explaining how and why an intervention works. So um, it's probable that you can't see in detail all of the words on the screen and that's absolutely fine. The point is, is that a theory of change is often a, di a diagram used to explain a pathway through an intervention, what the problems are and where the intervention goes in and provides solutions. So what we can see here in blue is our theory of the problem. Um, the problem that in Talking Together is developed to address is uh, weak or language skills in children age two. And then in green, we have the theory of the solution and the purple bubbles are where those pathways are supported by evidence, primarily re research evidence from, from the literature. So um, we have uh, distal risk factors, proximal risk factors. Those are the ones that the intervention actually goes in and works on directly, whereas for the distal risk factors, um, talking together provides signposting and, and support to, for, uh, to access outside um, services. And then through this work on non-optimal home environment, lack of parental knowledge about child development and, par and lacking parent sensitive parenting, um, it's um, hypothesized or, or believed that the intervention then goes on to improve children's oral language skills. So we 
developed this um, through conversations with uh, BHT, uh, the language development workers, um, and us as the research team to build up a shared understanding of why and how the intervention works. And this, this was really important in thinking about how we might evaluate it, because to understand how something is working or whether something is working, you need to test your ideas about how you think it's going to work to see if, if you can demonstrate in practice that that's actually what's happening. So that's what we did. This was the start of the process. We worked together to refine this um, theory of change. And this is then used as the bedrock for our evaluation going forward. The other thing we refined was our logic model. Now, some of you may use logic models, be very familiar with them and might have a different understanding um, of them from the, what, what we've used in ours. There are many different versions of logic models, but very basically, it's a tool for describing a strategy, a service or a program of work. And it helps you to demonstrate that path between key activities um, and projected outcomes. So, um, and we, we've used these very um, centrally in our evaluation work. Um, particularly our monitoring and evaluation plans. And, and this has been uh, useful throughout the time, but particularly when something like COVID happens, it helps you to understand why you're suddenly not getting the activities or outcomes that you expected. Um, and you can work backwards and see and, and clarify what is it that's actually happening or in the case of COVID more often what's not happening and then what's realistic to expect at the end based on what you know is and isn't happening. So very basically, the key ingredients for a logic mo model are what's the need? So what's the current situation? Claudine talked about the need in our community for um, support for children's oral language skills. What are the inputs? So who and what do you need to deliver the project? In our case, that's language development workers um, and um, access to homes with families. Um, activities, so uh, what are you doing? This is delivering the intervention and it's the language development workers who are doing it. Outputs, what's delivered? So that's six sessions of talking together. Um, and what tells us that these act inputs and activities are happening? So that's a, a bit about what are, the what are you actually measuring? And finally, the thing that everybody wants to know is what's the outcome? So what tells us it's actually working in the short and long term? And, and the long term outcome would be children's oral um, improvements in oral language. But as we saw in the theory of change, there's actually a step before that, and that's change in parental behavior. Um, so, and I'll come back to that because that's important in a minute. But first, I'm just going to talk a bit about how we changed the, the, the language assessment. So before the, the research team came, um, came in, uh, BHT were already doing a two-year language check and they were doing a really good job of this. Um, however, the way that it was being done was very qualitative. So they had a sheet and they would go in and have sort of almost like a semi-structured interview with a family where they would have a discussion about the child's language development, how they were developing, if the parent had any concerns. Then on the basis of that, the language development workers would make a decision about referring into talking together or not. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this process, but it's very difficult to evaluate. So what we did with uh, BHT was we came in and we um, took many of the questions that they were already using and asking families as part of that um, uh, as part of that uh, assessment. We added a few additional questions that we knew were relatively good predictors of children's or language outcomes based on the literature. And then we asked parents or language developers to record from parents whether children were doing these, uh, these um, uh, communication acts uh, not yet, sometimes or often. And because there are 10 questions, um, and each of the questions gets either zero, one or two points. It adds up to a total of 20 points and therefore we could sort of score and thereby quantify um, how well a child is doing um, in terms of their language development. Now, uh, there are still other parts of the assessment, so questions that we didn't necessarily need from the point of view of the evaluation, things like is the child still using a dummy or have they been referred on to other um, uh, services, um, but we, 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 we wanted to use the number in order to sort of look at whether there were um, appropriate trends in scores and referrals. So were the children who were scoring the lowest be the ones who were referred in and were the ones who were scoring the highest the ones who weren't referred in. The other thing we asked language development workers to do was to tell us why they were referring in because we knew that 
they had told us that there were potentially other reasons, such as children's behavior or a lack of appropriate home environment that they might um, refer into the service. And we wanted to quantify how many of the children that was the case for, or was it the case that primarily children were being referred for oral language? Um, and as it turns out, 95% of children are referred in because of oral language. So that's exactly what we wanted, but we know that now because we asked them language development workers to, to provide specific data on that. So that's been really useful. Um, and then the next thing that we asked uh, was that the language development workers also include uh, other assessments, additional assessments to the ones that they were currently doing with families. And this was to link up our theory of change. So while we were um, assessing children's outcomes, we weren't actually measuring anything about parents' outcomes um, prior to the evaluation team being involved. And that meant that we couldn't join up this theory of change. We couldn't see whether there was first a change in parental behavior or home environment, and then a consequently a change in child behavior. So, um, so that's what we, we included in, in the session. So we added um, a measure of parent-child relationship called the Maternal Object Relations Scale, the MOORS, and then we added a measure of the home learning environment. And we also added measures of child behavior. So this is the st uh, Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, a widely used um, tool, as well as two measures of, of oral language. So that was the CDI that Rebecca mentioned. It's the CDI short. So um, it's a list of a hundred common words that parents say whether their child understands and whether their child can say that word or use it productively. And then the welcome, which is a specifically designed um, early language assessment, holistic early language assessment um, that was designed for use by early years practitioners. So it's relatively short, quite straightforward, and is specifically designed for use with, with this age group of children. So the hope was that this would provide us additional information um, about that child's um, language abilities more holistically than just uh, vocabulary. So because of all this excellent work that BHT did and how um, accommodating they were in integrating these assessment measures into the intervention, it allowed us to apply for funding from the Nuffield Foundation, which they very kindly gave us, um, in order to conduct a feasibility study um, of, uh, of talking together. So. As Claudine said, the, the pinnacle of evaluation is a randomized control trial, but these are often very large and very expensive. Um, and for uh, projects that are um, relatively untested, jumping into a large scale randomized control trial can be a real risk uh, in terms of how much money you spend and, uh, and, and wasted resources if it's not well designed enough for you to um, actually get the outcomes or the, uh, the evidence that you need. So a feasibility study is the first step before that, where you're essentially piloting how to run an RCT to understand where the problems might be and how you can um, optimize your, uh, your design in order to get the best evidence from the more expensive RCT that will provide you the definitive results in the future. So we designed our, our feasibility study of uh, to test talking together um, and we called it otter so that it was um, so we could have a friendly otter picture to uh, uh, show parents uh, to encourage them that uh, to think that this wasn't a scary project and that they might be happy to be involved. And it's a two armed unmasked feasibility trial in a single site with randomization to either immediate intervention or waiting control. So I'll break that down a bit now in terms of what our design actually was. Um, but first, our, our, our primary objectives were to understand whether families would actually be involved in this type of a study. So um, this was uh, a, a new design um, and something that this community hadn't been involved with before. So um, research was relatively not of this kind was relatively novel for the community. So it was important for us to understand whether they would actually say yes to being involved particularly because the design was such that there was a waiting control group. So families who said yes were either um, randomized to immediately receive the intervention or they had to wait six months. And that potentially was a relative, that could have been an unpalatable um, op option for some families. And we didn't know whether they would be willing to say yes, given that gamble. So um, an important thing for us to understand was, were sufficient numbers of fa families eligible and were they willing to take part? We also looked um, in detail at how the intervention and the trial were implemented, whether there was fidelity to the intervention and um, the trial procedures, how acceptable all of these procedures were, whether randomization actually worked, um, how uh, data collection worked, and whether we could use this information to, to estimate a sample size for a future randomized control trial. 
So families who were being offered uh, uh, talking together were assessed for their eligibility to be involved in Otter, the trial, and they needed to, so families who were eligible for the trial were families who were living in the Better Start Reach, Better Start Bradford Reach area. They had to be no more than two and a half years so that our assessment tools were appropriate. They needed to speak uh, English, Urdu or Punjabi as their primary home language. And this is because the language development workers speak these three languages and the family needed to receive the intervention from a language development worker rather than through an interpreter, which does sometimes happen. But for the sakes of the trial, we didn't think it was appropriate because we had so little control over what type of um, evaluate or what type of uh, uh, interpretation was happening. So it needed to be delivered by a language development worker and they needed to have no known sensory or developmental disorders at the point that they were referred into um, the projects. And this is what the design looked like. So families were seen at their language assessment uh, when they were two years old as usual. And then if they consented to be part of Otto, they were randomly allocated to either immediate intervention or the waiting control. And the immediate in intervention group got talking together as usual. So they would they received the, the intervention and had assessments at the beginning and end of the intervention. Then they went through a roughly three month waiting period. And then there was a follow up assessment at the end. The waiting control group had assessment points that were at the same sort of um, beginning and end of, um, of the talking together period, but they were seen by research assistants rather than language development workers. They then waited a similar three month period um, so that this whole period took six months. And then at this point, they went on to receive the intervention um, after that final assessment point, if they still needed the, the intervention at that time. So families waited no more than six months um, to receive the intervention if they were in the waiting control group. Um, obviously, a feasibility study had requires a holistic approach to evaluation. So we also conducted interviews with families, with practitioners, and we thought about uh, about how we could scale up talking together to other areas in order to conduct that randomized control trial in future. So what actually happened in um, in our inter uh, in our study? So during our um, recruitment phase, six hundred and eight families were screened. Forty five percent of those families were not offered the intervention, but of the 55% that were, 78% accepted the intervention, 57% of those who accepted the intervention were eligible for the trial, and 54% consented. Um, so what that actually relate, uh, represents is that 190 families were eligible, nine, uh, 88 declined, and 102 were randomized. 52 to the immediate intervention and 50 to the waiting control. So that was really positive for us to, to see because it meant that our randomization procedures were working and that was one of our um, that was one of our questions. So that was very encouraging. However, another one of our questions was about how many families were actually followed up until the final um, follow-up point. Um, and in the intervention group, that was 33 families and in the waiting control group, that was 37. So that's a, a relatively significant amount of, um, uh, or meaningful amount of attrition. And it's definitely something that we have learned from and, uh, and know that would need to be factored in to any uh, future trial. Um, and it's also something that uh, we're looking into as to why, why families didn't continue um, through the entirety uh, of, of the intervention. Um, and, uh, but another important part of, um, of the study was understanding the impact um, of the trial on practitioners um, because obviously this is a whole new this was a whole new way of working for them it was additional work for them and we wanted to understand how they felt about it and um, and what it what they felt it, it how it they felt it impacted on their work so rather than me telling you all about that I'm going to um, go to a video of Chloe who uh, was the deputy uh, uh, in charge, the deputy of the language development team, I believe, and I apologize, Rebecca, if I've gotten her title wrong. Um, and she worked very hard to set up the um, the trial, and she worked very closely with the whole team, uh, guiding them through the process. So she'll tell us a bit about um, how she felt that this uh, aspect of their work went. Hello, my name is Chloe. I work at BHT Early Education and Training as a Deputy Language Development Programs Manager. I'm here today to talk a little bit about what it was like being involved in the Otter Feasibility Trial. 
We are always looking for new ways to grow and develop our Talking Together programme. And when we were approached to put the programme through a feasibility trial, we were really eager to be involved. Having never been involved in such large scale research, it was all totally new for us, but we were surrounded by an amazing team of research academics who guided us through this journey. We were involved in all aspects of the project, each of us bringing our own expertise to the table to transform talking together into something that we could collect really rich data from. As well as our senior leadership team being involved, it was also really important that our language development team were involved in shaping the study too. The language development team are the ones who work on the ground every day with families and they were able to inform the research team about what they felt would and wouldn't work. All new research measures that were brought in following the feasibility trial were all passed through to the language development team and their feedback was, was vital to the final implementation of the study. The study did result in a greater workload for the team, but I feel because we had involved them in each step of the process, they understood the need for the extra work and took to the new way of working really, really well. The team shared excitement of being in part of the study as they knew it was an opportunity for others to see how the work they carried out every day makes such a difference to families. Once the details were finalised and we could finally go out into the community, we were all really excited. When it came to recruitment, we had such positive response from families. And I put this down to the enthusiasm of the language development workers going out there and selling to families why it was good for them to be involved. It wasn't all smooth sailing. We did come across some challenges along the way. One of which being that the team had to learn a whole new computer system to input data to enable the research fellows to um, pull and analyse the data. After many a laptop nearly being thrown out of a window, the team slowly got used to it um, and now they're, they're all experts um, at data collection. Although learning a new data collection system was tricky, it is now a huge part of the way we work and it's such a benefit to us as an organisation. The data collection system enables us to collect data of progress families make that we are working with in a quantifiable way. This means we are now able to put on paper the hard work that our team do every day. And this enables us to create a stronger evidence case of why talking together is needed for all children who have a speech, language and communication need. Altogether, being involved in the research study has been such a great learning experience. We have already seen big changes to the way we work and we continue to look for ways the research can inform our practice moving forward. Here at BHT, we believe that the early years is such a vital time and we need more evidence to support changes to future practice. I would highly encourage others to join in any research opportunities that you can or even look to, at ways to devise um, ways that you can carry out research on your own. Thank you very much. Excellent. So that's our lovely Chloe. Um, I just wanted to pick up on two of the things that she mentioned there. So the first off was that she mentioned that all the new measures were passed through the language development workers. And this is this is very true. So every time um, me and the team wanted to make a change, we had a workshop with the language development workers where they fed back their initial thoughts or questions or concerns. Sometimes this meant that we were able to make um, changes or improvements. Um, to the measures so that they were more uh, suitable or easier to administer for the language development workers. Sometimes we weren't able to make changes, but just being having their, an opportunity to voice their concerns and for us to discuss why things were happening, I think, helped them to feel part of the decision making process and to understand why they were carrying out the data collection. And I think that was really key to the success and the buy in from the team and the buy in from the team has been vital to this project. Um, and the other thing that I think um, is really important that Chloe mentioned was that the data collection, while a very difficult challenge for the team to overcome, is now um, a legacy of this, uh, of this project for the team. So 
they now have ownership of their data collection. They're able to collect really rich rate, uh, data themselves. And so this, this adds to the sustainability of this type of work because it's no longer that they don't need the research team in the same way. They're able to do um, this type of evaluation monitoring independently, which is really fantastic and, and really what this type of research should be about. Um, so um, let me just... There we there we go. Um, but a few things, so in our, our interviews with families uh, or with staff, I, uh, I'm sorry, a few things came out in addition to what Chloe mentioned there. So um, the barriers for the trial were that uh, the language development workers were concerned that they were going to lose that relationship with families. Um, it turns out that the families didn't feel that in their, in their interviews, families still talked about how wonderful the language development workers were and what lovely relationships they had with both children and parents, but I can understand why the staff were concerned about that. They were worried that the parents didn't understand the trial, which was in some cases true. They were concerned about the time and complexity of data entry, as Chloe mentioned. Um, they mentioned that sometimes they didn't offer Otter to eligible families. Now, this wasn't very many families, but it spoke to the fact that language development workers were so committed to supporting children's oral language that sometimes they felt the child was in such great need that, that they didn't want to risk them potentially going onto the waiting control uh, list. Now, this is a, a methodological issue for the trial um, and something that would need to be addressed in, in the future. But I appreciated that the staff felt comfortable sharing with that, that with us because it was important for us to know that that was happening so that we could think about how to uh, remedy that in the future. And finally, the increased workload. And I think this quote on the bottom here really um, is, is a, a great indicator of the fact that as a practitioner, you can be positive about why something is happening and still be a little bit put off by how much work it is for you um, as an individual. And I think that's really normal. And I appreciated that the language development workers um, did all this work, even though it was, it was at times not always that fun for them, but they were committed to what it was going to show us in the end. And I thought that was really great. Facilitators for the staff were um, the team and the teamwork and support. They found the information leaflet really beneficial so they could be sure they were covering all the right information. They liked that the trial was offered in a range of languages so that it was accessible to more of the community that they worked in. They were committed to the long-term benefits. And again, this was one of my favorite quotes about how being part of research Add, added to the skill repertoire of the language development worker and, and quite a number of them actually commented on how they enjoyed being part of research and that they felt that they had learned skills that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and that's all another fantastic legacy um, of this work that um, I'm really I'm really pleased about. So what that means is in terms of our levels of evidence we've moved through all of the yellow um, uh, the yellow beginning levels of evidence are up to piloting for outcomes here. Um, and that's been the result of the Nuffield's, Nuffield Foundation grant that led us to, to this project um, that I've just discussed. So that's been, that's really fantastic. And it shows a, a big gain in, in uh, our evidence for this project. In terms of um, understanding what worked and what was problematic and running a trial in the future, we've come really far now that we've done this work and we're just in the final stages of writing up that report. Um, and the initial data suggests that it would be reasonable to consider scaling this project up um, to a larger RCT. And we know more about how we could do that now. And we're still analyzing our outcome measures. Um, so we uh, watch this space or get in touch if you want to know more about that in the future. And now we're on to any questions. I saw lots of um, things coming up in the chat, but I couldn't read them. So I shall stop screen sharing now and we can go to a question and answer session. Thank you, um, Dia and Rebecca, for taking us through that. Um, we have um, a question in the chat about um, supporting EAL children. So um, one of our uh, attendees has said that they have a couple of EAL children in their setting and they think that the language barrier might be an issue. And we do have quite a number of um, EAL children that, that BHT work with. Um, just to say as well, if you wanted to contact me offline about that, we, I've done quite a lot of work in the EAL realm with school aged children, so I'd be happy to talk about that. But um, Rebecca and Dia, do you want to say anything about that here? Um, Rebecca, do you want me to start? And you yeah, can I'll, I'll leave this one to you. I'm used to being the one that answers questions, so it's nice that you can do this one, Dia. Um, yeah, so the, the talking together is specifically designed to be about language, not English language. So um, the language development workers um, work with parents either in their primary language or if they have sufficient levels of English language skill, 
then they they talk to parents in English, but it's all about learning skills for supporting children's home language. So whatever home language they speak, this is about supporting children to become better language speakers, not better, not better English language speakers. However, it does present a problem when you're trying to assess children's language skills um, using tools that are designed for English. Now, the beginning sections of the welcome, for example, are relatively useful, kind of regardless of what language you're speaking, particularly when it's about nonverbal communication, or if you can get the parent to support you in administering the, the assessment tool. As children get older, that becomes less and less possible. Um, so there are definitely challenges there. However, the, the, the language screener, and um, as I say, the, the choice of the welcome um, was meant so that hopefully parents would be answering it about regardless, uh, what regardless of what uh, first language the children are speaking. But I don't want to diminish the fact that there are lots of challenges in working with EAL children. Um, not that being EAL is a bad thing, it's a wonderful thing, I was an EAL child, but it, it does present difficulties for assessments and I think that might be a good to topic for further discussion in one of the breakout rooms potentially if that was an area um, that, that people wanted to discuss more. As I'm aware I didn't do a fantastic job of answering that question, but I think it's worth getting in touch with Claudine or me if you want to discuss it further because there's there's a lot to cover in that question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dia. Um, one of the things that we, we've got a few minutes left and we don't have any specific questions. So one of the things we um, often do at this point is talk about how uh, the service responded to the pandemic. So Rebecca, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about going online and how you felt that went. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously um, we're all aware that we uh, currently in lockdown again um, but the first um, lockdown did pose a number of challenges uh, for us and the way that we delivered so um, as part of my presentation obviously I said that we were delivering in parents homes and that had to stop. Um, all our um, service delivery did move to um, video call um, or online with parents um, and we were able to respond pretty quickly within two weeks we'd um, ensured that we were um, providing the language development workers with um, phones to be at smartphones to be able to video call parents and um, we changed the the letters that we sent out for um, parents to have their language assessments over the phone um, and we've had a really good response um, from parents. We, we had to adapt um, the way that we delivered um, so they give the information to the parents um, over the phone and then um, some of the parents send videos, some of them do it live so they um, position the phone in a place where the uh, practitioner can observe the interaction between the parent and child and then they give feedback live um, or they'll watch the videos and then they um, contact the parent back um, and go through and give feedback to the parent about how they've, um, how they've been interacting and, and giving them the tips that way. Um, and it, it's, um, I think from the latest figures that we've, um, we've been able to pull, we've had a really good response. We're still seeing, um, I think around 57% of the families, which um, whilst we were in lockdown, we thought that was um, a fantastic number. Um, we, were, we used to see around um, 67, 70% of, of um, families that we wrote out to. Um, so I don't think that it's too much of a drop. Um, under the circumstances um, and where our, our referral rate has gone up though um, and we're seeing uh, we were seeing a, a referral rate of around 40% um, of children and now that's gone up to um, over 55% of children being referred into to the intervention. That's great, thank you. We've got another question in the chat. Um, we're, we're running a bit short of time. It's quite a big question, but maybe if you could just um, answer the first bit and perhaps we'll come up, come to the second bit um, when we go into our breakout rooms or in our question and answer session later. So um, what were the skills and qualifications of the language development workers who worked with the families? Um, so yeah, they, they all have to have um, a child development background, um, early years, 
works and understanding the child development, but we do have a lot that come from um, family support um, because the, it's a mix of the role that you're providing when you're out there in the parent's home. Um, so they, they have to have a minimum um, of a level three childcare qualification as they come to the team, but they have a rigorous um, induction programme and training that ha they have to go through um, before they're given their own caseload. So. Um, yeah, that, but the majority of the team um, have deg uh, degrees in early years, um, our family support, our social work. There's a mix within the team. Thanks, Rebecca. I'll just very quickly address the second part, but if we, if we need to talk about it in more detail, we can do that later. But essentially, um, in our project, we uh, weren't looking at the um, effectiveness of the evaluation. So we weren't directly comparing outcomes in terms of looking for significant differences between the groups of children on the outcome measures because this was a feasibility trial so what we were trying to um, look at was whether we could run an RCT which would allow us to um, look at effectiveness but what we can say is that we are seeing evidence of promise on our um, on our outcome measures um, and we're just pulling all of that data together for a report which hopefully should be um, available for people to read very soon um and and yeah that that's where we are with it at the moment okay thank you claudine um welcome back everyone um as i mentioned before i'm katrina i'm a research associate at the university of york and the beth Stop bradford innovation hub and we evaluate children's language interventions that are delivered um, in bradford by our service providers bht um, so i'm just going to share my screen with you now and I'd like to talk to you today about one of these language interventions, which is called Better Start Imagine. Uh, so Better Start Imagine is delivered by our service providers, BHT, as I mentioned, and Leanne, who is the co coordinator of this project, has made a short video to tell you a little bit more about it. So we'll go over to this video. I'll just pause Have you heard moment. about Better Start Sorry. Imagine? I'll just pause that for a moment so that I can make the screen bigger for you all. Okay. Have you heard about Better Start Imagine, a free book gifting scheme funded by Better Start Bradford, which is part of the International Dolly Parton's Imagination Library? So, what's it all about? Better Start Imagine has been designed for babies born in or after 2016 living in the Better Start Bradford areas. Every month they receive a free age appropriate book from birth to four years old. Not only that, but Better Start Imagine hold weekly groups and activities to assist and promote learning. To find out more about this amazing project or to sign your baby up, give us a call at BHT Early Education and Training and we'll guide you through the process. Have you heard? Oops. Okay, so that was Leanne talking to us about this project. And if we go back to the PowerPoint. So um, why is this programme needed? Well, um, the home learning environment is vital for early development. And a research has shown that um, the home learning environment is fundamental to children's language, cognitive, and also socio-emotional development from the early stages of life. By the home learning environment, we mean um, the environment that's provided by parents and carers for their child. So this includes activities in the home, uh, for example, reading and conversations, as well as, as activities outside the home, for example, music, uh, museum visits or trips to the park. Basically, it's any opportunity that parents take to engage with their child and use the scenario as a means for developing uh, language, number, self self-regulation um, and general well-being skills. So the home learning environment has been shown to be related to school readiness as well as educational outcomes at the early stage of education right throughout adolescence. But importantly the impact of the home learning environment starts to lessen as a child matures um, because they start gaining more independence and um, being more influenced by their peers or their teachers. So it's really these first few years of life that can have the most important and influential effect on what can happen to a child um, throughout their life, reaching 
reaching right up into um, adulthood. One way of impacting the home learning environment um, is to improve access to resources. And recent evidence suggests that book gifting does make a significant difference to children's outcomes. However, we do need to do more than just provide more resources in the home. Uh, re research has also shown that it's really important how parents engage with the resources that they have. Um, and so we wanted to know a little bit more about um, the view of reading in uh, families in Bradford. So we asked 56 families in Bradford about their reading habits. 57% of parents said that they did not read to their child every day. And over half the sample, 53%, did not think it was important to read to their children from birth. So clearly there's a need to um, support some families in understanding the importance of reading with their babies as early as possible and also frequently. And this is what the BSI programme seeks to do. The aim of the programme is to uh, improve the home learning environment by first of all increasing the number of books in the home. So it provides children with one book each month which is posted through the door uh, from birth right up until four years of age but it also aims to improve um, how families engage and share the books with their children. And so it does this by providing uh, regular sessions in the community that are open to all families. And these sessions uh, do many things, but for example, model effective book sharing behaviors. So when we wanted to recruit families into uh, the BSI study, um, this was a slight challenge. Um, when finding a sustainable model. Uh, initially, families were recruited through the BIBS birth cohort that Claudie mentioned at the start. Um, and this was possible because the birth cohort recruited women um, at pregnancy and so therefore allowed families to really take advantage and have as many books as possible. Um, it was also useful because the birth cohort um, knew birth outcomes as well, so um, we didn't contact any women that unfortunately their babies did not survive. Um, so recruiting through the birth cohort model was, was successful, um, however it wasn't sustainable because um, eventually the bibs would stop recruiting for participants um, and also we needed to um, embed the recruitment model into existing services. So this is why recruitment changed from BIBS to the health visiting service. However, this was an enormous challenge because as you can imagine, uh, health visiting services in Bradford are very stretched. They're um, understaffed and they suffer from lack of funding as well. Um, and also the optimal uh, health visiting visit, uh, the birth visit was considered uh, a bit too busy really um, to you know, allow for registration and the, the administration that that would involve. Um, so one more way that we adapted and to lessen the burden on health visitors was to provide a shared data linkage system. And by introducing the system, it allowed health visitors to literally just click a button and um, then that referral would go, go through to Leanne, who we saw at the video earlier and Leanne could then do the administration of registering the child onto the book gifting programme. So we can see on this slide, if we look at the pie chart, uh, we can see where the book gifting referrals came from. And um, the BIBS, that was the birth cohort, and also the health visiting service were similarly successful in their ability to recruit families. Um, in addition to this, um, we had 25% of families that were self-referred into the project and a further 7% were referred from other sources. Uh, so if we now look at the bar graph, um, we can see the age of the children uh, when they were registered onto the book gifting service. Um, as I mentioned earlier, BSI book gifts um, for children from birth right up until their fourth birthday. Uh, which would offer a total number of 48 books. Uh, so it's really important that children uh, be as registered as soon as possible um, in order for them to take advantage of um, the full amount of books available to them. And unfortunately, we can't retrospectively send books out. Uh, so as we can see in the bar graph, the vast majority, that's 82% of children, were registered between birth and two months. 
as we would expect given the primary referral pathways. Um, uh, an additional 18% of children were slightly older at the time of registration uh, because some of these children represent children that were born before the main recruitment pathways were established. So where are we now? We currently have 4,000 families that have signed up to receive books and since 2016 we've gifted over 92,000 books. Um, this year alone, sorry that was 2020 figures, um, uh, over 37,000 books have been gifted. So we can see that we have a huge impact on the resources that we're providing to these families in Bradford. Um, so we wanted to um, do a little bit of research about how families felt about this book gifting service. And so we interviewed 22 new Bibs mums. And a few um, <clears throat> key recurring elements came out from uh, the mother's responses. Um, they were very positive about the, about the book gifting and um, they expressed a lot of enjoyment. Um, in addition, they, they also said that older siblings often use the books um, with, their, with their younger siblings too. Um, however, however, a few families thought that the children were perhaps a bit too young uh, to be um, reading, which ties in with our findings earlier that um, perhaps some families think that uh, reading to their child from birth is, is a little too soon. So although many books are being gifted, uh, we needed to support the families to engage with these books in a meaningful way in order to support their child's language development. Therefore, sessions such as storytelling were delivered in the community and these sessions modelled effective book sharing behaviours. Um, so initially, uh, BSI ran two types of six week courses, which aimed to encourage sustained engagement with the wraparound services. The first version of these courses, Owlets, um, only had 20 attendees across the 19 sessions. So um, BHT responded that by this, to this <laughs> by addressing the focus of the course and ran sign, rhyme and bonding time sessions instead. And we can see 65 sessions were delivered with um, just over 100 attendees. Um, and uh, although that is some that is that is reaching some families, uh, we wanted to try and reach even more families. And um, so BHT uh, responded to this by um, changing the focus again. So storytelling uh, sessions were were delivered in the community and um, also rhyme time sessions. And Rebecca will tell you a little bit more about this in a moment, uh, how these sessions were combined for story and rhyme time sessions. So as you can see, the service providers are, are doing a huge amount in order to try and um, really engage with the community and respond to their needs um, by adapting the, the content of, of the sessions. Um, in addition to this, uh, BSI, BSI also visited early years and nursery settings um, to provide 14 sessions of the two-year storytelling offer. Um, and that was well attended. We had 59 attendees um, go to that. So now Rebecca from BHT will tell you a little bit about how they decided to make these changes to the sessions. Yeah, do you want to take it back again, Katrina? And I'll just yes, of course. Yeah. So like Katrina said, we, we did start out with the um, <clears throat> with the Owlets group um, and that, that was uh, aimed at children uh, from birth. So um, we, we wanted to ensure that we were getting those messages across to parents as early as possible. Um, and we transferred that group when we didn't feel that the attendance was um, as... Uh, doing as well as we we had hoped to the sign rhyme and bonding time session so um the um in the name it shows that it includes um sign a uh, baby sign in there some rhyme time sessions and the bonding time was around baby massage um 
and we still do run those those sessions um, the storytelling um, and rhyme time sessions were separate um, and but they were aimed at older children and in um, in different community settings around our reach area um, and then we combined that um, to get better attendance um, because we found that some parents were coming to both sessions anyway and they just wanted to come out um, the once. The um, two-year offer um, storytelling sessions um, they were really well attended and that that attendance is not just the um, the child in there at the setting it's the parents coming to support them um, in the setting as well so um, you can move on Katrina now yes so like um, Katrina said and, and as the slide shows um, you know we understood that our attendance um, to groups uh, wasn't as well as, as we would have expected um, and we wanted to be um, responsive to the um, to the parents to the um, people across our reach in, and try and provide them with something that they did actually want um, to access um, and as part of that we um, we undertook some improvement science work um, and looked at small areas um, and, and able to make small changes to the delivery model um, and then we tracked these changes to see if they improved the attendance and um, so where parents were saying things like oh they couldn't get to the settings because it was um, it was too far out and they didn't have the transport then we'd put the transport on for parents and um, it turned out that these didn't necessarily make the difference um, and that they were just different reasons that parents would give that they didn't actually improve um, the attendance. So we started to deliver differently um, again. Um, one of the things that has shown um, to work is the online um, sessions. So we, we put the baby massage sessions online as part of um, our response to the, um, the pandemic. Um, we put our storytelling sessions online and again they've um, they've improved and they're something that we're hoping to keep um, following the um, return to our normal ways of working. Um, so yeah. Thank you Rebecca. Um, so in terms of um, challenges for uh, the evaluation team, um, there are several challenges for evaluating the BSI project. Um, first of all is the attendance at sessions. Um, so unfortunately, if not enough families are attending sessions, then we don't really have adequate sample sizes for data analysis. And also um, data collection is slightly impractical because we'd need to gain consent from every family at every session that they attended. Um, another huge challenge of um, applied research and evaluation of interventions is the lack of routine data. Um, we're really constrained about um, the use of routine data, so we can't actually go out and collect the data ourselves. Uh, for example, the key outcomes that we'd really like to measure and assess uh, with this particular intervention would be behaviour change, such as changes to the home learning environment or the quality of the, the parent-child interactions with reading. But these aren't routinely collected and if we even think about children's language ability this isn't routinely assessed prior to five years of age uh, so therefore we need systemic change with data collection embedded into services to make it feasible to evaluate projects like BSI. Uh, another, another challenge uh, with BSI is um, there's no control group because it's a universal program it's offered to all children in the community which obviously is fantastic for them but in terms of uh, our evaluation it means that we can't establish a causal pathway between say attendance at a session or the amount of books gifted and later child outcomes. A uh, particular challenge this year has been um, COVID-19 obviously we've all been faced with that challenge um, so the face-to-face -face sessions uh, did have to stop and as Rebecca mentioned they were moved online where possible. Um, uh, this date is from uh, April to July last year um, so you know quite a short window um, but we can see 36 uh, online sessions were delivered with 235 live views um, which is amazing in terms of how uh, BHT have responded to um, changes needed in service delivery. Um, 
and over 6,000 unique views occurred over 28 days, um, which is fantastic. Um, these, these sessions were, um, <laughs> were, were put out online on Facebook, and so um, it's a little bit challenging for us as an evaluation team to, um, to be able to assess whether or not the um, unique views are from uh, our targeted families within the Bradford area. But um, I think that's, that's changed slightly and perhaps Rebecca can tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, where are we now with our project? Well, there's been a brilliant success, obviously, in the amount of books that have been handed out and there's been um, big improvements in the attendance at wraparound services. So in terms of our levels of evidence, what we have done so far is to confirm the theory of change through the literature. We've developed our logic model, so we know the inputs and the expected outputs from this programme. And so we're currently on step three, which is creating a blueprint. So we're still determining if the intervention is successful before we can evaluate whether or not it is, it is effective. And we'd be really interested in um, hearing about other people's experiences of book gifting in your local communities or other ways that we can encourage engagement from families at the wraparound services. And thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Claudine, who's going to tell you about um, ICANN. Thank you very much, Katrina. Give me a second while I share my screen. Okay. So, um, as, as we said earlier, we have three programmes that are um, that form the, the um, basis of our language and communication offer. Um, and we've already talked about two of them. The third is the Continuing De Professional Development Programme, which BHT are running. And this is the ICANN Early Talk Training. So I'm just going to talk about that. So, as I said earlier, a key feature of the Better Start Bradford project is to upskill the workforce that are involved in supporting young children and families. We know that development of professionals in the earlier sector has been a subject of some debate for some time. There's um, a recognition of the vital role that early years practitioners play in a child's early development. And I think that's really been brought into sharp relief by the um, pandemic in terms of um, uh, the support that, that early years uh, practitioners have been giving to children and families over the course of the pandemic. Um, Funnily enough, language and communication is one area that has received the most CPD opportunities in recent years. So the Nut Brown Review back in 2012 um, recommended that the early years workforce did need access to continuing professional development in order to progress in the profession. And the Sutton Trust in 2020 um, noted that that recommendation had not been fully realised in all areas. But language and com communication is one area that has been recognised, and I think that's because um, we're, we're just more generally, um, there's a growing recognition more generally of the importance of language and communication as a, as a foundation for all areas of a child's development. But we know that there need that that the need for language and communication in CPD continues. It's not something that we can, um, you know, take a short term view of. Um, it continues to be a priority given the number of children who have speech, language and communication needs. And as we said earlier, potentially a growing disadvantage gap as a result of the pandemic as um, uh, children, as language and communication perhaps becomes um, less of a priority um, in settings uh, as, we've, uh, as we've seen in some recent work that I'll, I'll mention. But just to let you um, know about the Continuing Professional Development Programme, this is the ICANN Early Talk Programme. And there are two elements to the offer that Better Start Brad, that BHT provide. It's that's the Working with Under Threes Programme and the Working with Parents Programme. So working with under threes uh, looks at speech, language and communication development of children from naught to three. Um, it helps uh, practitioners to identify risk factors for um, difficulties in communication. Um, it um, helps people to understand the role of practitioners in uh, supporting uh, speech, language and communication in children in this age, gr age group, as well as the um, importance of play um, uh, to and cognition learning and the interaction between all of those things and language development. There is a practical element to the training as well. So um, practitioners are giving lots of strategies and ideas for um, supporting language and communication development within their settings. 
and also um, to consider the role of the environment in supporting uh, you know how to have a communication rich environment so not just what you do but what the environment is like the working with parents um, element of the program helps uh, practitioners to understand the importance of parental support in um, developing children's speech, language and communication, um, helps them to be better prepared to work in partnership with parents to support uh, the speech, language and communication needs of the children within their settings and try and make sure that whatever um, speech, language and communication activities are taking place in the settings are somehow reflected um, also in the home. Um, it helps them to consider the activities and approaches that parents can use to support their child's speech, language and communication needs um, and helps practitioners to share some ideas with parents about what they can do. And really the key thing is working in partnership with parents. So, as I said, trying to make sure that there's a sort of parity between what happens in the setting and what happens at home. So the ICANN training is provided by a senior early years practitioner at um, BHT. The training is delivered over two days or four twilight sessions at times that suit the sessions. So that's a really important part is, is in the delivery is to ensure that the um, delivery can take place when the settings can access it, including evenings and weekends. So it's very flexible. Um, following the training, settings are supported to achieve accreditation for their language and communication provision. And what that means is um, it's a sort of recognition, a sort of kite mark, if you like, for the level of support for language and communication that the setting can provide for their um, for their the children in, in their care. So it's a really important piece of CPD um, and one in which we um, one which we're keen to evaluate, but there are, um, as with the um, Better Start Imagine project, some uh, challenges when trying to think about how we would evaluate this programme. So one of the first things is thinking about um, the key outcomes and how we measure these. So what we need to consider is whether the outcomes are at the setting level in terms of changes to the environment. Are they at the practitioner level in terms of changes in the practitioner's approach or um, behaviour? Um, or are they at the child level? So um, what the practitioner does has an impact that um, changes the child's language development. Um, and on top of that, we need to think about the integrity of the data. So there's a number of different settings that have received this training. So how could we guarantee the integrity of the data if we're asking nurseries to collect child level data? So how do we know that the uh, data is collected correctly? Um, and in the same way across all of the settings. Uh, and even then, how do we share the data? So one of the things that we um, have uh, come up against in all of our projects is um, the linkage of data. So how do we share the data and make sure that data that is collected is collected in the same way in different settings and shared in the same way? So if the data is collected, for example, by BHT, then we know that the data for talking together, for example, comes back to BHT and everyone uses the same system to enter that data. But it might not be the case that in nurseries they will have the same systems and therefore asking them to collect data and be able to share that in a way that we can uh, combine um, is, is quite challenging. Um, another thing we need to think about is um, in terms of if we want to collect child level data, is there any routine data we can use? At the moment, there's very little, as we've said, um, in terms of language uh, data that's collected until children are around five. Um, however, there is the new PHE um, ELIM assessment tool, which I mentioned earlier, which may provide us an opportunity to collect child level data if um, services are able to um, and willing to, uh, to adopt that measure. At the moment, it's not a, a mandatory measure, um, but it might give us an opportunity to collect some of that data. But then we need to think about how long we wait for a child to respond to a change in practice. So if we're thinking again, in terms of sort of our theory of change, what we'd expect is that the change would occur first of all at the practitioner level in terms of the training have an influence on practice and then it would perhaps have an influence on child level outcomes. But how long do we wait before we measure the child level outcomes? There are lots of other factors that might influence a child's language development. So we need to really think about how we can control for all of that and when we collect that child level data. Um, and then obviously, um, as with all of our projects, COVID-19 
um, came along and that meant that training had to stop. Um, and also it meant that only eight settings remained open in the first lockdown. Uh, obviously settings are all, early year settings are all open at the moment. Um, but settings remained open, which meant we couldn't go and collect um, any data if we wanted to, um, in terms of, for example, talking to practitioners about the, the, um, the training that they'd received. And also, depending on how soon before the lockdown the practitioners had had their training, they may not have had the opportunity to use the skills um, they developed during the training. Um, in, you know, so if we went and talked to them about it, they might not have had an opportunity to do that. So what we did want to do is um, find out a little bit about, um, uh, so we were at the early stages of evaluation with this project, it's fair to say. And what we did want to do was try and find out a little bit about what settings thought about the training they'd received. So as I said, we had 22 settings of the 36 that were eligible for training um, that had received training since March 2019. And that included, so that was 206 practitioners and that included three childminders. And that's quite important because often the childminders um, are left out of discussions about early years provision, but provide just as a, a good, you know, as, as a, a valued service as um, early years settings. So we incorporated um, all of those practitioners into the training. And um, six of our settings had received accreditation already. All of the settings were working towards accreditation, which is really positive because it shows that they're really um, uh, committed to providing good communication and language provision. Um, and as I said, eight settings remained open during lockdown. So we um, approached those eight settings and we spoke to six practitioners who had received the training before lockdown and the set and who remained open and we asked them a few questions about the training. So first of all we asked them what impact they felt the training had had on their practice um, and uh, the, the uh, comments we had were all very positive. So um, people were thinking about children as individuals um, speaking to the children a lot more when they uh, come into the setting. The other thing they talked about was gaining new ideas, things they didn't know before, and um, using those in the setting. So being able to take what they'd learned from training and put it into practice. And one of the, the um, things that kept coming up was the practitioner-parent relationship. So a number of the people we spoke to said that they really valued the work that was done on developing partnerships with, par with parents, particularly at the moment, because um, they were working with quite vulnerable people and um, obviously they needed to support the parents, not just the children, in order to help them to develop their um, speech, language and communication needs. We asked them what they liked about the training. One of the key things that came up was um, they liked the group activities. So they liked being able to share ideas. And I think that's particularly important for loan workers like um, childminders, being able to um, to be able to talk to practitioners, share ideas, share challenges, um, and uh, get other people's opinions on um, the issues and challenges that, that they face, and sharing good practice as well. Um, they really enjoyed the development, the learning about the development of uh, language and communication, so looking at um, getting more understanding about the typical progression um, for children at particular age points, but also risk factors around that and how children can vary in terms of their language development. And even those who'd received similar training in the past felt that it was really good to refresh their skills um, and to top up that knowledge. And I think that's really key as well, because we know um, that research is ongoing, research is dynamic, and we understand a lot more about children's language and communication skills now than we did a few years ago. And so approaches that can be informed by research um, are really important and it's, so it's important that you need to um, you know keep on top of those uh, advances. We also asked them about the impact of um, the pandemic on or, or certainly on the of the lockdown on language practice and this is what I was saying a little bit earlier in terms of um, perhaps language and communication not being a priority over the lockdown. So this was quite telling because staff um, all said that they felt that language and communication activities had taken a bit of a back seat because they were so consumed with COVID procedures in terms of hand washing, sanitizing um, and keeping uh, children in bubbles. And also that the language that children were exposed to was quite repetitive because they couldn't 
go on trips, they couldn't um, do things that, you know, go take children on buses or go to shops. So they weren't hearing the, as varied language as they uh, would be normally. And interestingly, um, in another survey, we um, asked um, early year settings uh, about their concerns about children um, over the lockdown. And 86% were concerned about the language and communication skills of children who were not able to attend settings um, over the lockdown. And as I said earlier, that's second only to personal, social and emotional development. And three quarters of our sample were prioritising language and communication when um, settings reopened. Again, second only to personal, social and emotional development. And we know that those two things um, come hand in hand. And then finally, we asked um, practitioners whether the ICANN training helped them to support families during training. And they all um, were very positive about this. They all said yes. They really appreciated having the ideas and the strategies that they could take from the training and use to support families who couldn't come into settings through making resource packs, craft packs, and talking to families on the phone, talking to parents on the phone, and talking to them about what sort of activities they could do with their, with their family, with their children, to try and keep that communication and language going. So um, uh, that, those are really positive comments that we had from, from our practitioners. So we've had lots of positive feedback, but as I said, we are still at the early stages in terms of levels of evidence here, um, probably about the same stage as the BSI. So we know what the theory of change is. We know what the logic model is. We do have a blueprint in terms of how the progress, how the process runs. Um, what we need to do next is think about um, developing a, a design for how to evaluate that process. Um, so we've got some uh, positive feedback, but we are still really fairly low down in terms of that um, that uh, EIF pyramid. Okay, um, so that is the end of uh, that uh, piece of the, the session, and we're moving into a second Q and A now. Uh, we've got a few minutes for the Q and A. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so um, okay, so we have um, a, a question here from um, Helen saying we're trying to develop the Imagination Library with um, Keithley Council. Uh, do you know of any funding streams we could look at? Uh, Rebecca, do you have any insight into that? Um. Not particularly, no, sorry. Um, we um, obviously were funded by um, Better Start and we did um, look to find some funding for that final year beyond the Better Start uh, funding. And we wrote to numerous different um, organisations looking for the funding um, and weren't very successful, um, which was really unfortunate for us. So, um, but I'm sure somebody that would be um, more savvy with looking for funding would, would be able to help with that. Our business manager might be able to help if you want to um, contact us. Um, she might be able to give you some more suggestions of places to go. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and um, you could also contact Better Start Imagine directly. They probably have ideas for, not Better Start Imagine, Imagination Library directly. Library, yeah. and, and they might have ideas for how other um, services are funded um, and then there are other um, successful best, uh, other successful imagination library um, programs running around the country some as part of the other better start program so um, we could certainly put you in touch with the um, Nottingham program for example because they have a very successful um, library as well so if you want if we have if you're happy for us to use your um, contact details we can send you some information after the session to try and yeah, we're, we're already working with Imagination Library oh, excellent. since the summer, but we have to get the funding. So I'm interested in how this programme was funded. Um, OK, so this programme was funded by Better Start Bradford. So as part of the Better Start Bradford project, we, um, we, the a charity called Bradford Trident received funding from the big lottery, or the Lottery Community Fund, I think it's called now. Um, and um, they commissioned and funded this programme as part of the Better Start Bradford project. 
So the funding for that came from the lottery. It might be that the, the lottery is an option to approach. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, have an, I'll have a think as well and see if yeah. I can come up with any other ideas. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions in the chat? The, sorry, the other, um, the most successful um, imagination libraries are either um, funded by the local authorities or the local Rotary Clubs. So um, that, that'll be one of the main suggestions that comes from the um, Imagination Library. because That's who they asked us to get in touch with um, for hours. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, so we've had questions in the past, which might be of interest to uh, our um, attendees here. So uh, one of the questions we've had was about ongoing support to practitioners for uh, the ICANN training and um, the accreditation time. So how long does that last? Um, Rebecca, do you want to? Um, yeah, so um, once they're accredited, um, it will last for three years um, before they have to go through a renewal of that. Um, they they get the support from the ICANN trainer, so um, Amanda will go into settings um, and support and mentor uh, staff through their accreditation. Um, and that's ongoing. They, they have groups where they can um, support each other as well, the different settings across Better Start, um, coming up with ideas um, of how to support the children. Um, so they just keep that link with, um, with us and, and with Amanda. Um, yeah, that's it. And in, in terms of the accreditation, Rebecca, does that, how long does that last? Three years. Three years. Yeah, so you're given 12 months to um, to apply for and gain the accreditation following the um, following the training. Um, and that's, like I said, supported by Amanda. And then it's three years after that, then you will we'll go for uh, to be re-accredited um, and to show that you've uh, maintained uh, the standards. So um, all the portfolios that are put together come back to a panel. There are a number of us that are ICANN trained within um, BHT. So we sit on the panel um, and assess those um, accreditation portfolios and then feedback. And Amanda takes that back into the setting and feeds back. Um, but currently due to COVID, um, that's all on hold. So it's all done over the, um, over the internet. It's all done via email at the minute. Great. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. We've got no more messages in the chat, so um, we can just um, move on to um, the next part of our session if people have no more questions. Um, oh, yeah. That's, thank you, Becky. That's great. That's very interesting. So Becky's just talking about um, funding for um, the Imagination Library. Um, okay, so what, before we go into the breakout, I'm just going to share my screen again and very quickly show you the um, results from the uh, poll that we did earlier. So you should be able to see there a PDF that says welcome. If someone could give me a thumbs up to say that that's there. Brilliant. Thank you, Katrina. Um, okay, so uh, if we just look at these question by question. So the most important factors in deciding on whether to run a programme, um, one of the most common ones there is obviously the evidence base, which is great, but it's not um, unsurprising to see cost and time commitment coming up as um, quite important factors there as well. Um, okay. Uh, how much evidence do you think is placed on, uh, emphasis is placed on evidence when making decisions about service provision? So we can see there that the, um, uh, the average response is kind of fair to middling, but there is quite um, a, a, a glut of responses towards the not enough emphasis side of the screen. So that's quite interesting. Um, and then how accessible do you think evidence is? Um, that's again, quite clearly more towards the not accessible side of the, the scale there. Um, but most people are confident in dealing with, in engaging with evidence to inform decisions, which is great and just says to me that we need to make evidence much more accessible because it's clearly something that people want to engage with. 
Um, and most people are very confident in supporting practitioners to evaluate their own practice, which again is, um, is, is really good news. Um, but again, just means that we need to do more to make those kinds of um, tools and resources available, I think. 